Hello and um, welcome. I'm going to talk today about the complexities of abusive marriage marriages that are faith-based. Okay, um, interesting topic. Hi, my name is Diane Simboro uh, of Thrive After Family Violence. For the past 10 years, I've been working with survivors of family violence to help them go from just surviving to actually thriving. Um, now, I want to warn you that this video of mine today may seem to be somewhat controversial, and I'm okay with that. But I'm speaking up on behalf of other women out there who have been have been or might be going through the same thing as me okay so that's women i'm talking about women who've been pressured by their religious community to preserve their marriage at any cost especially if their spouse has a, a public role in the community okay it comes down to the question is the ultimate cost to you and your children worth your perseverance in this abusive relationship and the more important question is, who benefits from me staying in this relationship and playing happy families, what I call happy families? Um, so remember, there is no need for an abusive man to change if you stay with him, because what he's doing is working for him. The only time he will consider change is when what he's doing is no longer serving him and he no longer has a willing victim. And obviously, willing is in inverted commas. Uh, no one willingly provides themselves as a victim to an abusive man. So yesterday I, I wrote a comment, there may be pressure exerted by others for you to follow the crowd. And I would, I'd say in simple terms, uh, follow uh, what I call the party line. I, I call it the party line. The party line when it comes to faith-based marriages is the belief that by leaving your marriage, you will also be deserting your faith and that it is a violation of your vows. Uh, and therefore, you should not leave. That's what they say. Therefore, you should not leave. The people who are telling you this are not living in the abusive relationship. So it's easy for them to say, just stay, you know. <laughs> then I wrote in my little comment yesterday, but if the recommended path means that nothing will change for generations to come, remember your kids are watching. Who's walking behind you? Your children. They're watching your example of a family unit and what is acceptable in a relationship between a husband and wife, okay? If the husband abuses his wife and nothing changes, the message to the kids is that this is an acceptable way for a woman to be treated by a man. It's painful that it is, that is, that's the message that the children are getting. We all learn to love, or we all learn how to love inside our family unit. Yeah, that's the school of love. So, when that love is linked to abuse and it seems to be condoned by a religious community that remains deafeningly quiet, definitely silent on the issue, or by their exertion of pressure for the couple to stay in that relationship, the effect is that abusive love is gradually normalized in the minds of the children who are watching and experiencing everything. The quote that I posted uh, yesterday was uh, by Emerson, do not follow where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. So, as I said, it may be tough at first, but pioneering a new and better path, that, that's a path that demonstrates a better example of a relationship between a man and a woman, one in which both partners can flourish and grow. You know, it's a better example for the kids. It's a choice between giving the message, whether intended or not, that abuse towards a woman is acceptable or giving the message that it is not acceptable behavior. So remaining in an abusive marriage, believing that it's a test of your faith, I've heard this so many times, 
plays into the hands of your perpetrator and can be used as a source of judgment that hits at the very core of your identity as a woman of faith. I have spoken about this issue publicly in my own religious community. My own marriage was a real interesting mix. I came from parents who represented Judaism on my father's side and Christianity on my mother's side. My husband came from a strongly Islamic family and I had a great, great, great Chinese grandmother who was Buddhist. So my family was like a, a little mini cosmos of integrated faiths. And I tell you this because otherwise you might feel like my story has nothing to do with your personal faith. Um, but I reckon our little family covers a pretty broad stroke of faiths in, in one tiny family. Now, some people do find it confronting, like confronting the issue of family violence, something that is they would prefer to avoid. And avoidance doesn't mean that the issue goes away. It just means that you don't have to confront it. They find it too painful to discuss and painful to admit that maybe abuse has invaded their community. And I understand that. But again, it doesn't go away by avoiding the issue. The reality is that many people have experienced family violence or sexual abuse in their childhood. Hmm? Others have experienced violence in their adult, adult, adult years. And that may be the reason that they searched for and found faith. That may be why they, they pursued that direction, thinking that they wouldn't find any abusive relationship in a religious community. They felt safe. But there is no one who is exempt. You know, family violence invades everywhere. It doesn't matter uh, what socioeconomic uh, area you're from, what culture you're from, what religion you're from. It's everywhere. So it's not something we can choose to avoid or ignore. So I have spoken publicly on this issue in my own religious community. This is a conversation we must have in religious and cultural communities. We must have it. Separation of the couple in cases of abuse is appropriate. Now, some people will not like me for saying that, and I don't really care. Why am I saying that? Because separation gives both partners the opportunity uh, to invest in their own growth and development separately and gives them time to recover as well. And it's also an issue of safety for the women and children involved. If there is sufficient positive change during the period of separation and adequate support you know, systems external, provided externally, like external, and within the faith community, there is a chance to reunify that relationship successfully. And that means minus the abuse, okay? But there is no guarantee. People choose to change, or equally, they choose not to change. All you can do is provide an opportunity and hope, hope for the best, you know? So I hope, um, I hope you understand why I've spoken about this. This is not a, uh, this is not a conversation that a lot of people have. Uh, they're not willing to have it. And uh, religious communities have a tendency to um, be optimistic that they think that faith will resolve every issue. Um, this is not something that just faith can get us through. This is something that we have to be very practical and very hands-on in order to deal with family violence, okay? Um, I hope to see you next time. I hope you, you manage to get through this. Please leave a comment and, or follow me. Leave a review. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to hear from you. Um, and I want to remind you, recovery takes place just one step at a time. Please take one step every day and celebrate every single step. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining me. Bye.